517,000 people still without service. Uh, they fixed about 330,000. They were up uh, well over 800,000, um, you know, a few days ago. Uh, they focused primarily on um, a clearing trees, making things road ready. That's part of the 250 roads that are still blocked, but we've made good progress on that over a period of time. And they've had to look at uh, the transmission lines. Those are the major trunk lines that feed the substations. You've got to get them activated first before you can um, start taking on the individual pockets of customers without service. Uh, UI has done um, better. At least they have a much lower percentage of their uh, customers without um, power. That's 22%. And I think Katie said they look to have uh, the majority of them up uh, in the next uh, 48 hours. Uh, there have been five serious injuries, um, a couple of fatalities, uh, sadly. People often in a car and a, tr and a tree comes down. I was sort of interested in terms of we had one of our unified command uh, calls this morning, one of, where all the commissioners are on board, plus the utilities, plus the telecom companies. Uh, it's really where everybody affected or affecting uh, the electric grid is on, plus all of our um, key commissioners. And Eversource gave their briefing, UI gave their briefing, and then they said, um, uh, tell us about any critical facilities that we should prioritize in terms of um, getting service back, and those that maybe are just now temporarily uh, operating with a electric generator. And all of a sudden, we heard from everybody. The, uh, Public safety said our troop barracks are down. And if you care about public safety, you can't just rely upon the generators. Uh, Kurt Westby, Department of Labor, they've had a lot of work to do, as you maybe know, since uh, COVID and all the unemployment claims. And now uh, they're working on an old generator right now. And he said if this generator goes, that will impact uh, 300,000 300, unemployment claims coming forward. We got that generator, it's still going, and uh, we're making that a priority. You know, Katie will tell us about the wastewater treatment facilities and, frankly, the freshwater treatment and our 36 public systems, all of which require um, ele uh, electric in order to process the water um, in both ways. Otherwise, there are spills on the wastewater side and tougher time getting fresh water out. Those are right now operating with generators, but generators can last uh, four or five days. You've got to have access to them, and it's a lot riskier proposition. Nursing homes, uh, we were told that about a third of our nursing homes um, now are not on the grid, but they are there with generator backup power. Uh, although in one case, the Deirdre said uh, the generator went down. You had to get there very quickly because you couldn't have seniors in 90-degree um, darkness. And uh, they did take care of that. The uh, telecom guys, you know, Frontier, Verizon, AT&T, the folks that uh, make uh, your cell phone work. Uh, you know, they said, look, we've got our cell towers. They have battery backup. Uh, that's a good thing. But the backhaul necessary sometimes to route that is uh, at, uh, a little bit of risk right now. You may see some effect on your cell phone service. Again, this was another piece of, quote, critical facilities that we had to uh, really prioritize. And then we finally got to the Department of Agriculture, and I said, I can relax here. But then I found out that there are... Um, hundreds of thousands of chickens that cannot be fed without electricity. I thought maybe you could just throw out the grass seed, but I'm living in the past. And these, uh, you know, vast, um, you know, chickens, uh, they, need, they need electricity not just for feeding, but for ventilation or they die. So these are the ideas. This is the scope of what we are prioritizing as we get um, electric back to each and every one of you. And I got to tell you, no, in certain terms, we're going to be uh, riding hard to make sure we get this done. I can tell you that Eversource, um, you know, maybe only had 450 line crews a few days ago. They'll have over 1,100 uh, within the next 24 hours, and I really want to see uh, more progress. I can't have um, a senior who's living alone with no electricity and no air conditioning uh, waiting day upon day upon day for support. This next slide um, gives you just an idea of some of the, um, what we're doing. This gives you an idea of, uh, look, the nature of the um, collapses of the uh, trees on the power wires and the lines that are going down. And we fixed the hundreds, but we still, as you saw from the other slide, still have over 250 block roads. And you got to get them fixed first so that the bands can go necessary to get power to everybody else. Look, we're going to have plenty of time to figure out 
what went right and what went wrong and how we could have done better. And Pura, which is the regulatory uh, body um, of which Katie used to be chairman, um, is going to be taking a good, hard, investigative look to see, A, all the money that we have spent at the ratepayer's expense over the last 10 years, what that has meant in terms of hardening our uh, critical infrastructure, hardening our electric grid, protecting it, the status monitoring we need, and why we, after 10 years of those investments, we still suffered such a hit with uh, almost half of people losing their power going forward. So we're going to have plenty of time to uh, Monday morning quarterback this, but right now our priority is getting you power back as soon as we can. And uh, I know there's hundreds of questions, and um, you know I can't leave you in the dark in terms of uh, what's next, when can my power go on, and uh, I've been told not to make any promises on behalf of others except for the fact that we're going to be focused like a laser beam until each and every one of you gets your service back. This grid, I think, speaks for itself, but um, there's the uh, email or the website as well as the telephone number for UI and Eversource. And of course, our friends at United Way, 211, as we try and route these signals and get you answers as best we can. I think it's going to take another day or so before um, Eversource can give a broader commitment in terms of how and when they get everybody turned on. But we'll have that for you as soon as we possibly can. So that's the first part of our briefing. Now let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming, which is the COVID-19 daily summary. And um, I, I consider this pretty good news. Uh, now six weeks running. Uh, no fatalities for three days in a row. Uh, hospitalizations up a little bit. Um, we've talked about that before. The positive cases, 20 out of almost 9,000. That's a 0.2% positivity rate. That is by far the best we've been since uh, the start of COVID. And uh, we're trending, not trending in the right direction, but holding the line, and this is a very good number. Uh, of course, you know, I'm paid to worry, and Rhode Island, our neighbor, is there at about 5%, and the Massachusetts, our other good neighbor, is there at about 3%. So, and COVID doesn't know these state borders. But that said, um, Connecticut still has all the metrics in place that allow us to proceed cautiously with the rest of our reopening plan, which gets us to uh, probably what will be the second half of our briefing, uh, Max. This is the safely uh, reopening the schools. And um, what I really wanted to be able to explain with uh, Miguel's help and Melissa McCall, who's here, together they've been working um, with all the superintendents. As you know, a few weeks ago, we got the first draft from the superintendents on how they could open schools safely. And we asked them to go forward with a full in-class uh, program, a hybrid program, and a, a distance learning program in case the metrics tra uh, changed and we couldn't do this safely. And um, what Melissa and Miguel have done is broken down in terms of priorities all the things that we, the state of Connecticut, will provide for our teachers, for our students, for our parents, and for our school systems to keep you safe. And I think you know from our last meeting, as soon as we don't think we can do this safely, we change course. So what we have uh, committed here um, is $266 million to help our districts uh, safely reopen. And Melissa reminds me, this is by far, of, um, you know, most of this comes from our COVID relief fund, the federal money we got. And uh, this is by far uh, one of the biggest allocations, the biggest allocation to um, school safety of any of our uh, Northeast regional states. So I think you know how seriously we're taking this. You know, I'd say that um, of the 266 million, um, uh, 99 of it has already been allocated previously uh, to the districts. That's money for you to invest as you see fit over and above what we are doing in, on the state level. But um, I would say over 50% is related to um, PPE and uh, everything you need in terms of a disinfectant and support to make sure that your school is safe, and make sure your teachers are safe, make sure everybody has the mask as needed. That's us, the state of Connecticut, providing that in no uncertain terms. The next biggest piece is related to staffing. And uh, there we've got about $50 million allocated for our, our, um, 
uh, school districts. And staffing could be a variety of different things. Staffing could be a social and emotional learning to provide support for our kids, most of whom have been really socially isolated for a long time, coming back to a new uh, situation. Some of that is related to what we're calling apprentice teachers. Um, or others who will be able to fill in the classrooms, since some of our older teachers or those with a uh, pre-existing condition will probably have to teach via Zoom and can't be in the classroom. Those are the type of uh, priorities that we have over and above the 90 million that is going directly to uh, each and every one of you, the schools uh, shared amongst you, so you can prioritize other. You know, smaller is uh, transportation, um, just because some of the school districts will require some additional bus support. And we are have, I think, three months of people there to help monitor um, uh, students on the bus as they go forward. And if you heard before, we've made a big commitment in terms of technology, the Chromebooks, hot zones, Wi-Fi, direct links, to make sure that any of the parents who don't feel comfortable with their kids going back to school we can take care of you in terms of distance learning. So I think this gives you an idea of uh, the priorities we got, the fact of the teachers and the schools, we got your back. We're putting uh, our money where our mouth is and prioritizing all the ways that you can get back to school safely. You know, so with that, um, why don't we just open up the questions, which I think would be uh, easiest to do. As I said before, Miguel is here as regards, he's been leading the discussions with all of our superintendents. Katie's been working very closely with our utilities. Uh, Melissa, as you know from OPM, has uh, run those numbers with Miguel, can give more context. And Paul and Josh, everybody knows what they do. Back to you, Max. News 8. Governor, when you talk about holding as many people accountable as you possibly can, what does that mean in terms of moving forward any type of um, fines or, or action taken against the power companies? Want to try that, Katie? So the governor yesterday called on Pura, the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, to open an investigation uh, to ensure that uh, as we move forward and pass the restoration of power and, and immediate addressing this emergency, uh, that there will be a full and transparent uh, investigation into the, the utilities' uh, response. One of the items that Pura, uh, the governor asked uh, Pura to consider and investigate in that docket uh, is uh, whether civil penalties should be assessed um, to the utilities uh, based on their performance. And, and of course, those penalties would come from shareholders and not from ratepayers of the utilities. Pura did uh, respond and open uh, that docket today. And so we're, we will be looking forward to participating um, in that docket to ensure that the ratepayers of the state uh, get a clear accounting for how their dollars have been spent and the performance uh, from the utilities that we all rely on. And for, for Miguel, because the whole uh, situation is so fluid, has anything changed in the last week or so uh, moving forward? Or because the numbers are still good, uh, things right now are pretty much as they were, say, a week ago in, in trying to move forward. I think the data just supports the encouragement of bringing students in to the schoolhouse as much as possible. Uh, so I think, you know, we're continuing with the message that we know uh, remote learning is not uh, the ideal option for students and where possible get the students in to give them that in-school experience and you know thankfully the data supports that I'm really uh, pleased with the data from today and I think that just supports the the work of our districts to get students in in person. Hey Miguel, I think you told me that about 55 percent of the schools look to have in classroom. Right we we had a uh, recent uh, information come back to the State Department of Education and and by and large, our districts agree, our district leaders agree. Uh, over 55% are planning full in-person learning. 44% um, are planning hybrid, some form of hybrid, but that could include buildings that have full in-person learning. For example, elementary might be coming in and maybe just their high schools are going hybrid. So uh, throughout the state of Connecticut, I think uh, most agree that we need to get our students in the classroom learning in a safe environment. Fox 61. Governor, you mentioned that you're launching the National Guard to help restore power. When will this happen, and what determines what areas they will hit first in the state? Uh, well, it happens immediately, and uh, right now, um, I think Paul will, can help me out with this, but I think primarily we've got roads we got to clear. 
and uh, that'll be one of their priorities. And I just want to say on behalf of the National Guard, I wasn't positive what the National Guard did two years ago. I sure know now. I mean, I was down in Guantanamo. I see these guys guarding prisoners. Uh, I saw them building field hospitals during the peak of COVID when we might be overrun. Now they're clearing roads and doing a lot of frontline work. They're amazing. Paul? Uh, General Ivan has done an amazing job in leading uh, the group. Uh, they will be embedded uh, with uh, both uh, UI and with Eversource uh, to debris uh, removal that will allow for the make safe uh, priorities of various towns uh, to be able to be accomplished. Uh, they are already starting. Uh, they're going to be going up in the air uh, starting tonight, and then they'll also be fully embedded uh, starting first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, the governor made that uh, announcement and that uh, declaration, and General Yvonne and his team got right to work, as they always do. And we thank you for always stepping up to the call. And then with the extra help, um, is the time frame still the same for some residents? Those that want to prepare for the worst, are they looking at like a Sunday, Monday, in terms of pe when people could see their electric back up and running? I'm happy to respond to that one. Sure. Um, so uh, as as whenever we have a storm that hits, the utilities uh, are required to follow an emergency response plan, and that involves first assessing the damage, um, addressing critical facilities, and within a, a reasonable period of time after they've done that assessment, providing an estimate of when they expect the majority of their customers to be restored to power. United Illuminating has provided that estimate. Uh, um, uh, clarifying that they uh, announced it at 2 o'clock today uh, that they expect to have the majority of their customers restored by the end of Saturday. Uh, we're continuing to wait uh, on Eversource's report. Uh, they have uh, indicated to the governor uh, that they will be providing um, that estimate later today. Um, and once we have that, uh, they will be telling us when they expect the majority of their customers to be restored. But we don't have that um, estimate at this time. NBC Connecticut. Good afternoon. Governor Craig Hellstrom with Eversource just said that the cost of this will ultimately end up in customers' bills. I just wanted to get your reaction to that statement. I think that's why we're going to have a Pure investigation. I think that's why Pure has put um, any rate increase on hold for now. Um, so let's leave it at that. And how much of the problems and issues that we're seeing right now do you actually attribute to Eversource's lack of preparedness? In other words, do you feel that another utility company, say National Grid, could have reacted faster and done more? Well, let's start with the fact that this was a brutal storm that hit us and uh, far exceeded just about any hit we've had. I know it wasn't a broad-based hurricane with those winds, but those tornado-like winds that really hit through caused extraordinary damage. Uh, that said, um, you know, my philosophy has always been hope for the best and plan for the worst. And I, I think that Eversource didn't plan for the worst. I don't think they had the people staged in place ready to go as soon as um, uh, we saw the scope of what was happening. You know, but there's plenty of time to look back. I'm looking forward right now. We've got to get more people on the ground, more boots on the ground. Uh, we get the roads cleared, get those main transportation hubs going those trans transition hubs going and then focus on getting people turned back on and I am going to push every day to make that happen. And lastly, um, are you concerned at all about the primary? About the primary? Yeah, this came up a, a little bit because a lot of people are voting uh, in schools in the primary. That's coming up on Tuesday and they asked me uh, what happens if we can't open the schools because there's not power there by Tuesday and I said I'd be really angry if the schools were not open available for voting on Tuesday. And I can follow up to say that uh, Chairman Gillette from Pura convened a task force today of the utilities and all uh, related agencies. Uh, the Secretary of State's office participated in that call. Um, so we, all the information has provided to the extent that there are any polling locations that have been impacted um, by outages. Uh, the utilities have that information so that they can prioritize those uh, for restoration. So I uh, feel confident that those uh, priorities will be addressed. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Hi, good afternoon. Um, recently
currently it was reported by uh, DOL that its contact center is operating at 50%. In what other ways has the outages affected the department with so many people still seeking unemployment? You know that, Paul? Um, I can take that back. For Josh? Sorry. Um, yeah, that, that's it so far. So the, the Department of Labor is running on a backup generator at this point. Their main headquarters is, is on uh, backup. So we are concerned about that. If that generator were to fail, um, that would take down their systems and could potentially impact the uh, processing of unemployment uh, compensation this week. But so far, that system is holding up. That uh, particular site is escalated with Eversource uh, along with a number of other critical facilities that we are trying to prioritize to ensure power is restored. And to add to that, we also have other state facilities that are working on backup generating power, uh, including our DOT facilities, uh, as well as some various uh, ESS-related uh, facilities as well. Uh, we have, as uh, Josh stated, we have provided those related lists uh, to uh, ever source the UI based upon where those buildings are located, um, especially for the needed standpoint that we are still in a uh, crisis and we still have to respond to that. Uh, so we provide those lists uh, to them as well and we'll continuously follow up with them for uh, restoration. Uh, we are a little bit of feedback. Um, uh, Shante, if, if you could mute yourself when you're getting the answer to your question, uh, that would be great. Uh, but now go ahead and ask your follow-up. I do apologize for that. Um, and I just wanted to share this with you, Governor Lamont. I've had a viewer who uses a wheelchair and he tells me his elevators are not working. He's essentially stuck in his apartment. I've heard of people who rely on CPAP machines at night say they can't sleep ever since EC has. I've spoken to a hotel which says most of their guests are coming from people who are lacking power at their home. What would you say to those people right now? What do I say to those people right now? That um, that's why we're going flat out. This is absolutely unacceptable. But first of all, those people in an elevator and other of those emergency situations, let us know. We will take care of them. Uh, we'll take care of them by police, state police, state trooper, whatever it might be uh, necessary to get that done, uh, Connecticut Guard. Uh, but as I said before, I understand that on top of COVID, on top of the economic uncertainty, uh, on top of the electric bills you got last week, all of a sudden your power is not on and it's impacting at 1.46% of the state. Um, first thing I got to do is make it better for you as fast as we can. And I think um, we're pushing that. WTIC 1080 News. Good afternoon. Melissa, a question for you. What are the what are the budgetary ramifications of this storm? Um, well, uh, you obviously have Commissioner Katie Dykes here to speak to some of the policy and, and regulatory components. Um, typically, with um, a storm of this magnitude, you would often see some additional expenses in the Department of Transportation. Um, so we would expect that perhaps in fiscal year 2021, we might have some additional expenses in the transportation fund associated um, with their responsibilities um, related to storm coverage. Um, so we'll obviously continue to monitor. It's very early in the fiscal year um, to, um, to have a sense of what those costs might be, um, but I'm sure we'll be able to sort that out. And for Commissioner Dykes, the governor alluded to this yesterday in Middletown, you know, we've got Millions of trees, power lines above ground. Is this um, just unavoidable considering the way the grid is set up and the way the power lines are in a heavily wooded state? Is this just what uh, customers should expect? You know, um, this is an issue that uh, has been looked at for many years, uh, since, uh, particularly since Connecticut was impacted by those severe storms in 2011 and 2012. Um, undergrounding power lines is something that people have talked about 
um, as a potential solution, but it's extremely expensive uh, to put power lines underground. It also is very hard to then go and repair them if there are, uh, are any challenges. Um, uh, but there are a lot of different solutions uh, that can help uh, to ensure that when there are outages or storm events that occur, uh, that the time that people are without power is as short as possible. That includes uh, effective tree trimming. Um, it includes uh, investments on the grid itself uh, to be able to automatically have parts of the grid be able to be restored without sending uh, a truck and a crew out to make that restoration. Mm -hmm. It also includes investments in things like smart meters um, so that the utility can know right away whether your power is out without having uh, to have you call and report it in. Um, we've seen you know, that uh, many of these investments have been made over the years in some of these efforts. Uh, that's what the, the governor has called on Pura uh, to look into to make sure that ratepayers, uh, that those things have been functioning properly and that the leadership of the utilities um, have been utilizing those tools effectively to make these outages as short as possible. And Pura has also been looking into already um, additional ways to modernize the grid uh, again so that the families and businesses of this state uh, don't have to suffer longer than necessary whenever we have this type of the, a storm event. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, so I guess this could be for the governor or for Commissioner Dykes. Uh, in the Pura docket, it says exactly how these utilities need to prioritize bringing back things online after they go offline. Are you satisfied with Eversource's response and their decisions of what should be a priority to come back online? I can say, you know, again, um, there's a sequence to how storm response occurs. Um, first, uh, the utilities need to accurately forecast and prepare and preposition resources so that they can hit the ground running to start restoring power as soon as the winds die down and the storm passes. Uh, then the utility needs to effectively and efficiently assess the damage and then restore power to the, those facilities that have been designated as critical before that they can go in, such as the wastewater treatment plants, the police stations, all the things the governor in, indicated, um, before that they can go and then work on the broad broad-based uh, restoration for all customers. Um, uh, the governor uh, uh, visited Eversource yesterday because uh, we've been, there's a concern about whether Eversource properly prepositioned the resources they need um, to be able to effectively deal with the storm of the magnitude that we've experienced. But um, right now, the focus is on making sure that the restoration can occur, including addressing critical facilities. Uh, the time for uh, then assessing um, how the utility, uh, whether they uh, reconnected uh, those critical facilities in the right priority order will be after uh, we get past uh, getting people their power back on and have time to assess that um, as part of the Pura investigation. Okay. There were some uh, mayors or first selectmen in uh, eastern Connecticut today that were worried. Johnson Memorial apparently seemed to be offline and there were some other critical infrastructure in that part of the state. Um, that wasn't getting attention and they, you know, there were some towns there um, that didn't even see a crew last night. Yeah, it's very important that towns are providing that information. That's why they have the, the local EOCs. The utilities are expected to have community liaisons who are accessible 24-7 in every single one of those EOCs when they're opened at the municipal level. And uh, the governor, uh, through the Unified Command and the task force that Chairman Gillette um, has been leading, uh, that is exactly the priority that he's the, the, he and the chairman have been driving, is to ensure that critical facility information is identified, that utility uh, folks are connected and getting that information so that we can get those those facilities that are so essential for public health, public safety, um, that those are restored as quickly as possible. And I believe Thank every you. hospital is on the grid right now getting power. All the hospitals are back up? Yes. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thank you. Um, who is going to hold Pura accountable for how it handled uh, its uh, oversight of these two utilities? Um, obviously, it's not going to investigate itself. Uh, certainly, the legislature 
as an independent branch of uh, uh, co-equal branch of government can can look into it. But what is this administration going to do? What are you, Commissioner Dykes? Are you going to be looking into how they uh, did their jobs? <laughs> well, um, Pura operates as an independent body um, uh, with uh, independently appointed uh, commissioners. Um, they have their process provides a, a, all of the parties and participants an opportunity to participate to ask questions of the utilities all uh, the utilities witnesses will be under oath uh, we have the ability to uh, request documents um, it's the best possible place uh, for the state for the ratepayers of the state to get a full and fair uh, accounting of the utilities performance um, and so we look for deep uh, is a participant and a party um, in cases before the Pura uh, as is the Attorney General um, and the Office of Consumer Council um, and, and other participants and parties who uh, are affected. And so we look forward um, to Pura's uh, a fair and uh, in-depth review um, uh, in the, on this particular matter. But shouldn't somebody be taking a look at how Pura did its job? If we're going to be examining how these two utilities prepared uh, for the storm and responded to the storm, why wouldn't somebody take a look at what Pure did, even if it is an independent organization? Well, Pure decisions are also appealable to state courts uh, to the extent that parties want to um, seek review. Um, also, I know that the legislature, uh, the General Assembly has, uh, in many uh, instances, uh, requested Pure to provide reports um, or testimony uh, to uh, the legislature to ensure um, that members of the General Assembly are also informed about Pure's uh, decision making. I would say, Paul, you got a great new uh, chairman of Pura. Um, she's doing extraordinary work. She's taken a good, hard look at um, the both utilities, seen what's transpired over the last 10 years, make sure that how that money was appropriately invested, taking a look at the rate structure as well. I have a great deal of confidence that um, uh, Pura is going to do the right thing and hold people accountable. And what's your level of concern about um, a setback in uh, the state's progress in the uh, COVID-19 outbreak as a result of, of this uh, storm and its uh, widespread outages and uh, the lengthy uh, restoration time. I don't see that as a big concern. Um, look, we're, we're bringing in some crews from out of state. Um, uh, you know, every time you bring folks in, maybe, uh, you know, you've got some people who are in shelters. I think most of the mayors have been really good in making sure people keep their distance there. I don't think uh, this storm is going to be particularly impactful to what's going on with COVID. As you know, I do worry about the fact that some of our neighboring states see a flare-up. Uh, that could cross the border pretty fast. And uh, Josh and I are focused really closely on our colleges because that's going to bring in students from around the country and around the world. So make sure we do that safely. Okay, thank you very much. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hi, Governor. Um, you mentioned the uh, cell phone or telecom providers earlier, um, but I was just curious uh, if you've spoken to them. I understand a lot of their infrastructure relies on um, a lot of power, obviously, and, and they're using backup power. What is the, the reality for them, and um, should people be concerned that they're going to lose cell service if power isn't restored? I don't think so. I mean, we had Frontier and uh, AT&T and Verizon, I think, on the uh, call today, the unified command call. You know, they have standby power at each and every one of these cell towers. It doesn't go forever. So we have to make sure that we have a roadway clear so they can go up and make sure that the uh, standby power is fueled. I mentioned um, what I heard on the call, and it was some of the backhaul where you take some of that uh, data traffic, uh, you know, back to a substation. That could be impacted by the electric a little bit. Uh, so you may see some um, service degradation, but I think we're going to be in good shape there. Uh, and we've heard from a number of municipal leaders. Um, many of them are saying that they are dissatisfied with the communication from Eversource or they haven't heard from them at all. Um, Katie, you mentioned the community liaisons. Um, we've heard from a couple who are really satisfied with their communication. Um, what are you hearing? Are you satisfied with Eversource's communication with state agencies and municipal leaders? Well, I can start. I mean, I was at West Hartford today, and uh, we met the town manager, and they have a um, Eversource liaison, and they're in daily contact. 
And uh, then we went to another town and they hadn't seen a truck or anybody from Eversource. So it sounds like it's a little bit um, hit or miss. I will tell you when it comes to uh, the mayors that, um, you know, we're going to be on a call with every single mayor in the state in about 45 minutes giving an exact update from Eversource and UI, how it impacts their towns and what we're doing about it. I would say a lot of the challenges uh, in terms of not just communication, but we hear, we've heard from a lot of municipal leaders saying, where are the trucks? Where are the, where are the personnel? Where are the boots on the ground? Um, and that's why the governor's focus has been so much with Eversource about making sure um, that they have the crews uh, in place, uh, if not at the time of the storm, unfortunately, but now uh, getting those folks uh, here in Connecticut, getting them out working. Um, and, and as uh, the governor has been driving um, to ensure accountability and urgency at the leadership level of the utilities, and um, uh, it's also really important to, to share that uh, how grateful we are for the men and women um, who are working in those line crews, uh, clearing trees. Um, who are uh, uh, utility personnel who are out there um, away from their families and uh, helping to get power uh, turned back on. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Connecticut Public Media. The Associated Press. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, and Commissioner Cardona, many families have uh, long planned vacations towards the end of the summer, towards this, just before the school year starts. Um, a lot of them in these hotspot states. How concerned are you both about this impacting in-person learning starting on time for a lot of these students? And what are you recommending to these families who are trying to decide whether to cancel vacations or change plans? Sure, so, you know, the quarantine uh, is, is a requirement and that's not something that you, you want to flex. Uh, so pa families have to plan accordingly and understand the importance of the quarantine uh, if they do choose to leave the state. Let me be a little stricter on that. Don't go to South Florida, don't go to Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, skip El Paso, Texas. And I'd stay away from South, Southern California for a while too. I mean, I would stay close to home. I think there's some amazing places you can visit here and to do it a lot safer. And Commissioner, what can you tell uh, parents about starting online and then going back to school to ensure that people just don't not tell it, you know the teachers that, that, that they've been away and make sure that this doesn't this doesn't happen listen our success in our school system is going to be based on everyone working together so we're going to have to be open and honest about if someone's not feeling well when they uh, wake up communicating that uh, to prevent uh, risk of infection it's everyone's job to make sure that we can open safely and uh, have a successful school year so the message to, to everyone is just start having those conversations if you're not feeling well you shouldn't be going out if you have an event planned in the community and you're not feeling well you shouldn't be going out these are all strategies that everyone should be taking in particular when we're thinking about bringing students into school it's going to be critically important not only for students but for our staff and finally, can I get an update on contact tracing, how that is going? Are people cooperating? Um, what have you seen with that program? Like that, sure. Jeff. Yeah, um, our contact tracing program continues to proceed um, very well. For several weeks now, we've been receiving 90% uh, or greater um, outreach to uh, impacted uh, cases within 48 hours, uh, which is above our goal. Uh, we're getting about uh, over half to two-thirds of people uh, successfully interviewed, providing contacts and cases, and then we're following up those people rapidly as well. So the team is at Public Health and our partners in the local health departments have really done a great job standing up this process from scratch over the last couple of months, um, and it's having a, a very beneficial impact. We're continuing to look at ways to improve it and expand it and increase the reach and, and the benefits uh, from a public health perspective, but it's uh, going very well overall. Thank you very much, Governor, and Sue Haig censored me. The Hartford Current. Hello. Um, the Governor mentioned at the beginning um, two fatalities related to the storm. We had heard about one yesterday. Um, does anybody have information on the um, other person who died? Any of you know I that? Don't. 
Naugatuck and Newtown. I'll have to get back to you on the specifics of that. Sorry. Okay. Um, and also, Governor, you uh, mentioned hospitals at one point. Um, we have heard that the VA hospital in Rocky Hill was having some trouble and that there was talk even of evacuating patients. Can you provide any update on that situation? I think that's a good point. I think they were on standby power for a while. Do you know about that? I don't yeah, know. Josh. They're, they're still on, uh, on generator power, but uh, thanks to support from our emergency services team and our National Guard team, they've received additional fuel delivery. So they continue to um, uh, operate on backup power uh, while they await restoration of their street power. So there's currently no plans to evacuate anybody? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Thanks, Max. Um, and I had a little technical issue. I don't know if this was asked, but when it comes to the the money for education, um, how did you come up with the number of 266 million, and what are the prospects for more money? You want that, Melissa? Uh, well, great. Thank you for for the question. So, uh, as the governor announced. Um, the state is making a commitment of $266 million towards the successful reopening of our schools. That does include approximately $160 million from the federal coronavirus relief fund, um, coupled with um, over $90 million that um, has already been announced to districts through the CARES Act elementary and secondary um, education relief fund. Um, in addition, approximately $15 million is coming from the governor's emergency um, education relief funds. Um, so we are braiding multiple funding sources to, um, to attempt to meet the needs of the districts. Um, as the governor and Commissioner Cardona indicated, our priorities um, were one to ensure public health and public safety, hence uh, the significant support in PPE and building cleaning costs and some um, supplemental support for additional custodial staff. Uh, the governor has previously announced uh, a priority to ensure that the digital divide um, is eliminated. So it was a, absolutely a priority to ensure that every student um, had a device and could connect um, in a remote environment. Um, and, and transportation is also linked to the public health um, priorities to ensure that where there are densely populated routes, um, that additional uh, support, additional routes could be funded. Um, and lastly, some academic support. So again, the priorities are public safety, public, uh, public health, and the academic supports that are necessary to, um, to ensure that the program and the reopening can be successful. Governor, you've been clear that you prefer classroom instruction for, for a variety of reasons that you've made quite clear. Um, but what, what assistance can the state offer parents beyond the technical uh, piece? You know, you're gonna, you have school systems have already announced they're going to have somebody's kids in for two days, and then they're going to be home for three days. And obviously, uh, nobody's uh, work schedule, or at least very few people's work schedules, uh, can accommodate that so is there anything that the state is contemplating about addressing that need that parents will have whose school systems are going to be taking that approach yeah that's a good question Paz um, I'll, I'll start with the positive I was very happy that a majority of our schools want to open uh, on a five day a week basis full time uh, if and those parents that don't feel comfortable with their kid going there they have an alternative I was happy with the the uh, the rest of the schools that didn't want to go full-time, most of them were providing full-time, at least for the younger grades. As Miguel said, high school is much more likely to be um, on a hybrid basis, and uh, we don't have to make as many accommodations. Those people are, um, you know, young, young adults are better able to uh, telelearn, better able to take care of themselves. I've been pretty impressed with some of the ideas that uh, I've heard Miguel has told me about. For those parents who have younger kids who maybe they're on a two-day on, three-day off, and that doesn't necessarily fit their working lifestyle. Um, and some of those schools are offering, um, you know, setting up a computer lab, for example, in the cafeteria or a gymnasium, which will have, um, you know, staff people to oversee it. So they're not in the classroom, per se, but at least there's a way that they can continue their learning 
and, uh, and, and be taken care of while their parents uh, maybe have to work. So I think we're seeing a variety of interesting ideas come forward. Others are teaming with some of the not-for-profits, uh, a Y or a Boys and Girls Club, and trying to get an arrangement there for those off days where those young people aren't in the classroom. Have you given any further thought to whether or not the state would mandate an approach, uh, particularly if the infection rate continues on the trend that it's in right now, where you had 0.2 percent, you know, positive rate? Oh, mandate that those hybrid schools go full time? I don't yeah. think so. I mean, I, I heard a lot about flexibility and one size fits all. I heard that 150 times last week. I think superintendents like the fact that um, Miguel is giving them some flexibility, that um, some schools are very crowded, some schools are a lot less crowded, so let them make some of that determination. I like the way it's sorting out, though, that most schools are prioritizing in-classroom education. And if I can add, uh, Governor, you know, this process, as, it, as we mentioned before, it's going to be fluid. So it could be based on the health metrics that we have to move in one direction or another. We really need to establish an accountability system to ensure that wherever possible, students are given an opportunity for in-person learning. We know that's a better option. We support when decisions have to be made to ramp down to promote health and safety, but we also want to make sure if this is here for the long haul, that we're doing our very best to improve the conditions to allow for more students to take advantage of in-person learning. Thank you. Hey, Governor, I just want to jump in from a previous question we just received. Uh, the information back from our emergency operations center. Uh, the fatalities uh, that occurred was a, a tree burst car accident in Naugatuck and a chainsaw accident that occurred in Newtown. Uh, we send our thoughts to the, to the families and friends of those individuals. Thank you, Paul. Um, look, we didn't really need um, this tropical storm and uh, almost half the people losing their power given everything that's going on this year to date. Uh, but I just want to follow up on what Katie said. I mean, we've got folks uh, in this state working 18 hours a day, climbing poles, people coming in from out of state, living in their dormitory, uh, far, far away from, um, you know, their families, um, climbing a pole, sometimes wearing a mask, taking care of what we got to do. I mentioned our Connecticut Guard. My God, they thought they might get a short break. It wasn't much of a short break. So. Let's stick together. We're going to get through this just like we're getting through COVID. Thanks, everybody.